I was recently accused of being dogmatic while talking about pair programming. I get called dogmatic quite often. I don't really mind too much, but I also tend to think of myself as being something very different to dogmatic. I guess everyone thinks that though. So today I'd like to explore something that regular viewers here will know is very close to my heart. Science and engineering as anti-dogma approaches to learning and solving problems. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I advertise my YouTube channel as being opinionated, and it is. But that isn't the same thing as being dogmatic. Dogma is defined as a principle or set of principles laid down by an authority as incontrovertibly true. I don't see any of the practices that I recommend here as incontrovertibly true, but I can see all of them as being the closest to true that we have so far, but that isn't the same thing at all. Show me where I'm wrong and I'll change my mind and my advice. So see, not dogmatic at all. I suppose that some people may see me as an authority on the topic of software development and software engineering, and without being too immodest, I think that I'm pretty good at it. But I certainly don't think that I can or should tell you exactly what to do. The opinions and advice that I offer here are meant to encourage people to think differently about what it is that we do and how it is that we do it. If my stuff makes you think, but you end up disagreeing with me, that's fine with me. If you can show me the, ho the hole in my arguments, then even better. I believe that software development is a very difficult thing to do well. It takes informed, intelligent, thoughtful people, usually collaborating effectively to do a good job. It's an act of learning and discovery. The myth of the lone rock star developer is exactly that. It's a myth. I believe that most professional software development is a team game and organising how we work and recognising that and to take advantage of it is important to our success. However, this is more complicated and nuanced than we often think. Effective collaboration is essential to doing good work, but it's also very tricky to get right. And one of the many ways in which this is difficult is that I think it's too naive to assume that all opinions are equal. Some ideas are just dumb. The earth isn't flat and waterfall development is a terrible idea for building software. This is one of several agile heresies that I hold, in that I think that agile development often errs too much on the side of equivocation. I think that we should call out the bad ideas more clearly. And it is here that I think that people often confuse what I am saying with dogmatism. Let me pause there for a moment and say thank you to our sponsors. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Tricentis and Transfic. All of these companies offer products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel here every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, click on the links in the description below to say thank you to them and to check out their often helpful information. There's a distinct difference between being opinionated and being dogmatic, because I can be opinionated based on evidence, but as long as I'm prepared to change my mind when presented with new evidence that shows that I'm wrong, I'm by definition not being dogmatic. In general, I don't expect people to believe what I say because I say it. I hope that people will follow my line of reasoning and either find that helpful or interesting, and if I'm wrong, show me the places where my reasoning breaks down. This may all seem rather philosophical and tangential to the topic of software development and software engineering, but I think it's important because not all opinions, all ideas are equal. If they were, then we could never rule out the bad ones, and that's where I think that equivocation gets in the way. We need to be able to rule out the bad ideas, otherwise progress is impossible. And if the only way we can do that is to depend on the authority of experts, then we are being then dogmatic. So how could we do better than that? We need a model for identifying the bad ideas and ruling them out. 
There's a wonderful description in Carl Sagan's book, Demon Haunted World, that he calls the baloney detector. But it's really a practical version of scientific rationalism. In it, he identifies nine steps to identifying bad ideas and spurious arguments. So let's take a look at those in the context of software development. First, look for independent confirmation of facts. Can the claims or results be reproduced? The fact that my team practiced test driven development and continuous integration to build one type of software isn't enough for me to claim that it works for everyone. All I can say is that it worked for me and my team. But it may have only worked for us because we may have been lucky or unusual in some way. But if lots of other teams that are well known for producing good software like Google, Amazon, SpaceX, Microsoft, Tesla and many, many others found the same advantages that my team did when they adopted the same practices, and they did, then that strengthens the argument for my position that these things are good for everyone. So now these things may be ideas that are worth looking at in a bit more detail and exploring. If some practice has demonstrable value in a wide variety of different teams with different groups of people involved in different types of technology, then that's a much stronger argument then than me saying it works on my team. But even with that external validation, it's still not enough alone. Some common popular ideas are, are dumb too. Debate between experts about the evidence for claims can help us to identify weak points in the ideas, and that's a good test of these ideas. If I can have rational discussions with people with different perspectives, that's how I get to improve myself. I'm generally up for debate on the topics that I talk about for this reason, but let's also be clear, the debate needs to follow Sagan's guidelines. If someone's saying, I prefer X, while I say I prefer Y, that isn't a debate. One reason that scientific style rationalism is important is because it doesn't rely on preference. I don't promote test driven development because I personally prefer it. I promote it because I think it works better. And importantly, to my mind, I can give you several reasons why I think it works better that go well beyond my personal subjective experience of using it to build complex software systems over the course of many years. Having a model of why your better practice is better is important because then we can start to test those models. Item 3 on Carl Sagan's list highlights my preferences and subjective experience should not be enough to convince you whoever I am. Again, the whole point of science is to free us from the shackles of arguments from authority. It doesn't matter where the ideas come from. If they're bad ideas, they're just bad, no matter how famous or how much you admire the person who came up with them. Equally, if someone you despise comes up with a good idea, we should be able to adopt it despite our personal dislike of that person. We should treat each argument on its merits. Don't adopt continuous delivery because I say that you should. Find ways to test the ideas and see if they seem sensible. One easy way to do this is simply to think about it. Build these mental models and try our ideas out against them. Do these ideas make sense and fit into your model of why things work as they do? But now we're back to the necessity of having a model of why A works better than B that allows you to compare it to the alternatives. Imagine having fast definitive feedback on the releasability of your system multiple times a day. Ignore how you got it would that be better or worse? Would that help you to build your software better? I'd say that it's clearly objectively better to have that feedback. Ignore for a moment how difficult it might be to achieve it, but does the goal sound sensible? That's a good starting point. If that sounds good, then we can try and solve the second part of the problem. How could we achieve it? If you think things would be better if you reach that goal, try it out in some simple controlled way. Take a small step towards the goal and see if you get closer to it or not. Maybe try using measurements like stability and throughput to see if this different way of working improves either the quality of the code that you produce or the speed with which you produce it. If it does neither, you should ignore me or anyone else that says that it does. But generically, in the case of continuous delivery at least, the data says that it will improve both the speed and the quality. Try out different explanations and ideally try to find ways to disprove each one. Whichever explanations are left, whether you prefer them or not, 
these are more likely to be the correct ones. Let's be clear here. I'd prefer to work alone on a feature branch and never have to merge my changes with anyone else's ever again. But if I'm working with other people on a, on a team, my experience and my mental model of what's going on, as well as the experience of other people and the empirical data, says that continuous integration works much better than hiding my work away until I think I'm finished. So I do that instead. Experimenting this way can be difficult to do, particularly if you don't already buy into the ideas that I tend to promote, because one of the best ways to conduct these little experiments for software is to capture them as tests, test-driven development. A good test in test-driven development is an embodiment of a hypothesis for what the code is meant to achieve. If the test fails, the code isn't achieving what the test set out to demonstrate. It really is that simple. This is a good experiment and a good thing to know and is one of many reasons why I value test-driven development quite so highly. If we aim to be rational in our evaluation and adoption of ideas, we can't afford to hold on to them too closely. Even if you love an idea, actually especially if you love an idea, you should be critical, skeptical of it and willing to discard it if new evidence comes along to show you where it's false. Show me an easier way to get feedback on my design choices and verification that I haven't broken anything within seconds of committing a change and I'll drop test-driven development and adopt your approach. But stating that it is impossible to build complex systems with test-driven development is simply factually incorrect and demonstrates either ignorance or poor skills on the part of the person making this argument. Unless they assume, that is, that the software in SpaceX's rockets or the software in the high-performance financial exchanges that my team used to build with test driven development doesn't count as complex. Statements like that are dogmatic because they don't agree with the evidence. I am sometimes asked what I see as the difference between software engineering and software as a craft. My short answer is measurement. We should seek ways of measuring things. But for software, this is about more than only quantification. Though where you do have something that's easily quantifiable, by all means use that. But I can measure something in two different ways. I can apply some standard unit of measure, and I think that is what we tend to think about when we start talking about measurement. But I can also compare something to something else that I already have. Does my new shelf fit into the space that it's meant to fit into correctly? That's measurement too, and it's often much easier, more pragmatic kind of measurement, no less accurate and maybe easier to see and understand how to apply it when working with software. That is exactly what we are doing when we apply the test-driven development style of automated testing that I recommend. We specify a test as a specification of the behaviour that we'd like our code to exhibit. This is our measurement. This defines the space that the shelf should fit into. And then we build the shelf to fit into that specified space. As I said, the more normal form of measurement that we tend to think of is useful too. Stability and throughput, latency and so on. But I think that this more empirical, does it fit kind of measurement is often more useful for us because software is so varied and variable that we can't often find sensible, generically applicable units of measurement. So thinking in terms of defining how we will measure each change, which tests to write, is in most cases the more straightforward course. But it's still measurement. One of the things that I think is often missed when we think and talk about science is about finding good explanations for things uh, more than proving things. Modern science doesn't really aim to prove things at all. Instead, Mostly, it works to disprove things. For this, we need a model, a chain of reasoning, and our goal is to find mistakes in our chain of reasoning. As an example, consider the debate between people who like working on feature branches and those that prefer continuous integration. I would argue that the reason that continuous integration is the better approach is based on logic. First, knowing if our code works matters because unless it does that, it isn't really useful to anyone. So if we're working as part of a team, how can we tell if our software works? Well, the only real answer is to see it all working together. Otherwise, any one of us might have made some subtle mistake that stops it working. So we need to see it working together to really know. 
By definition, if I have changes in two different branches, yours and mine, we can't be sure that it works together until we merge those two branches and test them together. That says that we need to integrate the branches together before we know that our software works. If code is in two or more places and it's changing, it will diverge. And the longer it's separated, the more it will diverge, which means that to reduce the chances of the code diverging in a way that may stop the separate versions from working correctly together, we need to reduce the time that they're separate. That tells us that we need to integrate continuously. By definition, in continuous integration, we set a limit to how long code is allowed to be separate. That time limit is usually defined as a maximum of one day before any, everyone integrates their changes. This way of working means that we get to see all our code working together at least once per day as the code is being developed. If you don't do that, it's not continuous integration by definition. So we get better and clearer insight into the state of our system as a whole more often. And the more often we merge our changes together, the better our insight. For this line of reasoning to hold, all of these things must be true. So for example, if you aren't practicing continuous integration, if you run tests on your local feature branch, you aren't doing CI if you pull changes all of the time from main or trunk, because you aren't integrating the changes from other people's feature branches because they're not pushing them either. I don't see any holes in this line of reasoning. If you do, let me know in the comments. But to convince me, you need to meet the same criteria or show why they, those criteria are wrong. Don't tell me that this can't be done because it works and is used by many world leading development teams to organize their work. Don't tell me that you prefer something else. Show me instead how what you prefer is at least as good as this at confirming that our code is working at least once per day, every day. Occam's razor says we should always pick the simplest explanation. So another reason that I like continuous integration so much is because I don't see a simpler way to confirm at least daily that our code is all working together. Continuous integration is the simplest approach, so it wins. Designing your software into components and allocating work to people to avoid clashes when you merge is a much more complicated thing to do well enough to avoid breakages. The last in Carl Sagan's list is to challenge your own ideas, in particular in the sense that you can falsify your ideas. Back to continuous integration as an example. One of the arguments that people have used to show me that I am wrong and that feature branching does work better than continuous integration is that the merge tools in modern version control systems are so powerful now that you don't get merge conflicts. This is a good claim because it's falsifiable. Because if I can point to some code where the merge tools will mer successfully merge the code changes together, but that the result is wrong and not what was intended, then I can demonstrate that this argument is false. Here you go. Here are some changes that will merge successfully and produce an invalid result. On the other hand, if you say that feature branching works better for teams that aren't very skilled, we cannot falsify that because if I find a team where continuous integration works, someone will say that they are too good. And if I find a team where feature branching doesn't work, someone will say, but there are teams where it does work. This is not a falsifiable claim. So it's a weak argument. I like Carl Sagan's baloney detector a lot. And I think that software development and probably the rest of the world would be a much better place if we applied more of this kind of thinking more often to everything that we do. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks again for watching. And if you do enjoy the stuff here on the Continuous Delivery cha channel, please do consider supporting our work by supporting us via Patreon. There's some great discussions going on on our Discord community at the moment. Please do join and join in the conversation. Thank you.